Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Minox AL and it's one of a number of models of 35mm cameras made by Minox. You might be forgiven for thinking, looking at these, that they are all very similar and just variations upon a theme and to some degree of course you would be correct. However, they do all have their own unique specifications and features and they all do differ a little from one another. Arguably the AL differs from the rest of the range uh, the most radically. But let's go back a little little time in history. The original 35mm Minox camera was the EL and that came out or was announced in 1974 and went on sale in 1975. And you'll see that the EL, the GT and several other models all have this faux pentaprism casing. In 1985 Minox launched the MB and ML and this is uh, one of the limited edition versions of the MB, which has a more square-sided or square-topped top. So that came out, or a version of it came out in 85, moving away from this star casing. So it's perhaps a little odd that the AL came out in 87 and reverted back to this style of housing. Let's start by putting some batteries in and see what makes the AL stand out from the rest of the range. And when I say stand out, that doesn't automatically mean it's better than the rest of the range. That may not be the case. So let's pop these things to one side and take a closer look at the AL. As ever, let's start by putting a battery in it and this is where things begin to go wrong. In 1987, the AL and the other Minox cameras in this style used a PX27 Mercury cell, and that worked fine uh, in 87. But in 1996, Mercury was prohibited from use in batteries. Now this meant that all the 35mm Minox cameras, the batteries suddenly overnight became unavailable. Uh, Minox did produce uh, a little sleeve like this, which takes two DL third end batteries. A DL third end battery is a three volt battery, so two of them would be six volts. The original Mercury cell was a 5.6 volt battery. If you go on to a Minox users forum type group uh, and say, does anybody have an AL, what's your experience with batteries? Everybody's experience appears to be different. Uh, some people will say you can get a version of this which has a little diode or something similar that steps the voltage down. Some people say it will run just fine on the silver oxide version of a PX27. Uh, some people will say you can get various hearing aid batteries and wrap them in electrical tape and captain tape and that sort of thing to get up to that 5.6 voltage. Now, some people will say if you use a 6 volt battery, the camera is prone to overexpose by as much as two stops. I'm not sure I entirely subscribe to that school of thought, however, that is the experience that some people have reported, and I have to respect the fact that, that is their experience. For me, because the original Minox adapter took two 3 volt cells, I'm inclined to feel uh, confident or comfortable using a 6 volt cell in the camera itself, and so whilst I can't tell you what's going to work for your camera, I can tell you I used a PX27A silver oxide 6 volt cell and I had no problems with operation or exposure, and it worked just fine. Possibly it won't last as long as an original mercury cell would, but I'm not going to be using it that often for it to be a concern to me. So, the battery sits in just under here. I'm never sure if I prefer these screw-in battery covers or the later push-flat battery covers. Now I need to get this the right way round, the plus side faces outwards, so that's the plus side, so it's going in that way. Put the cap back on, hopefully it will go on without a fight. Well, let's not cross thread it, that'll be bad. As ever, I'm doing this at arm's length from behind the camera, so I do tend to struggle a little bit. So, having put the battery in, let's go ahead and look at the top plate. This is very similar to the top plate on a GT. I mean, it's the same. 
And remember, this camera came out two years after Minox was started selling cameras in this style. It's pure speculation on my part, but I wonder if the Minox factory found they had a number of these shaped shells and circuits and so forth, and decided to make a, an entry level version of the camera um, with the parts they had available. But that's pure speculation on my part. So, the top plate. We've got a battery test button, and if you push the battery test button, we get a red light comes up on the viewfinder, and it should blink away. We can't really see it on the video because of the way the video shutter works. But it should blink at uh, a fairly rapid rate. Also on the top plate we have a self timer. And like a lot of uh, these small Minox cameras, it's not self cancelling. So when you take your self timed picture, you need to remember to turn it off. The other thing is, if you use a flash unit, because you're perhaps at the company Christmas party, so if you're using the flash unit, you can't access the self timer button. So if you want to get yourself in the picture, you have to take the flash unit off. Turn the self timer on, put the flash unit back on, take your self timer picture, and then if you don't want to take another picture of yourself, take the flash unit off, turn the self timer off, and so on and so forth. And it's just a little inconvenient. It is a common feature on um, these Minox cameras that the buttons get covered up when you put the flash unit on. This particular flash unit, incidentally, isn't the one recommend, uh, recommended by Minox for this camera. This is an FC35, it's an FA35 for the AL. Although you could use this, and we will talk about that a little bit later. You could use almost any flash unit. So, battery check, self timer, exposure compensation. This will brighten your image by uh, two stops, or uh, yeah, two stops. It just makes it brighter. If you've got a lot of sky in the scene, you might find your landscape gets silhouetted. So that will avoid that problem. Then we've got the shutter button. Double stroke winding on Minox cameras. So to wind on one frame you have to move the lever twice. Next to the self timer is the cable release socket. So you can use this on a cable release. And then on the other end we have the rewind crank. Now I mentioned this camera was intended for uh, or to be easy to use, certainly in comparison to some of the other Minox cameras. Uh, also intended to be a lower cost entry into the Minox 35mm range. And in actual fact, in the brochure, Minox published, the AL is the right camera for you if you know nothing and care nothing about photographic technicalities. So they really wanted to make this a stripped down easy to use camera and I'm going to compare it now to the GT. Now the main market, whoops, sorry about that, the main market for uh, these 35mm Minox cameras were keen photographers who perhaps had a 35mm uh, SLR or maybe even a medium format camera but they wanted a small high quality camera to take with them wherever they went and uh, whilst there were many automatic compact cameras Canon Shortshot, of course, the classic example, Nikon uh, AF2, AF3 type cameras. Many enthusiast photographers love the fact that these Minox cameras had manual focus and aperture priority. So they could control the depth of field, they could feel they were having an influence over the exposure, and they could be confident that whatever they wanted in focus would be in focus. So it gave people the... Uh, a certain amount of control that uh, a keen photographer would certainly want. That was the core market for these cameras. So to make an easy to use one, well remembering at this time there were plenty of automatic, fully automated 35mm cameras um, for let's say the mass market, the high day and holiday type user. So a uh, Minox like the GT or the MBML was attractive because of its size, but very unattractive because of its 
relatively high price and relatively complicated way to use. So what did Minox do to make the AL easier? Well we spoke about manual focus and of course manual focus is not something uh, people want to mess about with if they want an easy to use camera. So the easiest way to get around the issue of having a manual focus lens is to have no focusing at all. It is a fixed focus or a pan focus or some people would call it a focus free lens. So it, it doesn't turn. It's just fixed. So the next way of making this easy to use is instead of having aperture settings, those funny complicated numbers, if you didn't know anything about photographic technique, numbers like 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22, all gibberish. Doesn't mean anything if you're not uh, actually interested in photography. But people do understand sunny, overcast, cloudy, and a little bit beyond that. So this is uh, a weather symbol exposure camera, which is you know, very approachable to most people. Now, as you change the weather symbol, the camera proactively alters the shutter speed. Now, there's lots of other cameras that have used weather symbols in the past. Uh, I think most people will be familiar with Kodak Instamatic cameras from the 70s, where you had the cloudy, sunny type settings. But those cameras were not altering the exposure. You set the symbol for the weather prevailing and the shutter speed stayed the same. With this camera, as you change the weather symbol, the camera actually does something to influence the exposure in terms of changing the shutter speed. So possibly, one could argue, this is not an aperture priority camera, but a weather priority camera, and possibly the only weather priority camera ever made. The other cameras with symbols being effectively fixed exposure. Just my little flight of fancy. So there we go. We set the weather symbol. The camera sets the shutter speed. The shutter speed range is from one second to one three hundredth of a second. And you can probably see there's a blinky light going crazy in the viewfinder there. Oops. Because the shutter speed at that point has dropped below a thirtieth of a second. So that's your camera shake warning. That's the only thing really you need to know. Now the trick of using this, obviously we want to maximise our depth of field being a fixed focus camera. That's the only way we're going to get any guarantee of sharpness. So if you set the weather symbol to the brightest weather, the sunniest weather, if the light flashes, you need to open up the, uh, the ring to a dollar weather setting until the light stops flashing. So as you transition from blinky light to non-blinky light, that's where the 30th of a second kicks in. Now to be on the safe side, when I do this, I just open it ever so slightly more past the point at which the light has stopped blinking. Because I think a 30th is, is perhaps pushing one's luck a little bit. So let's go ahead and put a film in here. Film loading, as with all 35 minutes cameras, is not the easiest, but it is perfectly possible. So we move this little lever to one side. The whole film back comes away to reveal a chamber for your film, a take-up spool, and obviously the film gate at the back there. I'm going to reveal one of these slots. Put the film leader in there. And pull the film cassette over to the left hand chamber. That all looks good. Getting the camera back back on is a little fiddly. There we go. And then we close it up. We just want to make sure that this is properly seated on along the, the seam there. Then we take another frame or two. Now this is already doing it, but I always suggest to people that they pull the rewind crank up. We have a fight there. Take up the tension in the film cassette. And then as you wind on, you'll see that moving, which confirms the film has been pulled out of the film cassette and is transporting through the camera correctly.
So we go ahead, we take our pictures, making sure to avoid the blinky light. And then we come to rewind the film and we push the rewind release button in on the base plate just here. And again, when we extend the rewind crank this time, we will actually be rewinding in the direction of the arrow. I think that got it. Until there's no resistance. And there we have it. So not impossible to load and unload, and if you're experienced with 35 mm cameras, you'll have no trouble at all. But as this was intended for a non-photographer, um, it is a little suboptimal. Now, of course, today, somebody using this won't be a non-photographer. Uh, somebody without any interest in photography, the photographic techniques and so forth, will almost certainly use a mobile phone or uh, some other digital camera. People using this today will be people interested in or are knowledgeable of or wishing to learn about photography. So let's look at the flash settings. Firstly, let's consider it if we had the original flash unit, the FA35. The flash symbols are on the side of the lens here. And again, we don't have uh, aperture numbers. We have distance scale based on size of portrait. So a half length portrait, a couple is a half length portrait, full length, and if you're being a little bit optimistic with the flash range, even beyond there. So instead of saying on a lookup table, if your subject, I don't know what the lookup table is like on this, if your subject, if you're using this speed film and your subject's this far away, you look down here and across here and you find the right number. No, none of that. You just say, uh, yeah, well, it's um, probably a half-length portrait. And there's your exposure set. Now, if you wanted to use an alternative flash unit, and if we look at this, hopefully that's in focus, we do need to know our film speed. And on this camera, we have a choice of 100, 200, or 400. I'm going to assume we've put a 400 speed film in. And then this particular flash unit has two automatic settings. You can see they're color-coded red and green, and in the middle, is basically full power. So I'm going to go with the nearer distance. So this is the subjects up to four and a half meters away. If I'm shooting 400 ISO, I need F8. But I don't have F numbers to work from. So this lens effectively is F4 to F22. So I'm going to say if that's F22, that's probably 16, 11, 8 is going to be somewhere around there. Now it's unlikely I'm going to use this camera with multiple flash units, so I might need to take one or two trial pictures the first time out just to dial that in to the power output of my flash unit, but you should be able to calculate or work out where to set this for your particular flash. Now talking of the 100, 200 and 400 ISO, on the more regular Minox cameras let's say, the ISO dial is on the base plate, this particular one is very scratched and hard to read and it has a lot of options so this goes I think from 25 to 800 or maybe even 1600 ISO whereas on the AL that bit's blanked off and we've got a slightly fiddly little lever here and, we move, and can you see this window just over here if I move that lever over and turn super fiddly there we go turn this out of dial you can just about see i set that to 100 that should be 200 and oh, that's 400 that is 200 and lastly 400 now i shot a 200 iso film and that did mean that um i could use the 100 and 400 settings as a poor man's exposure compensation if I wanted to make the pictures a little darker or a little lighter than, um, than the camera thought. So let's take a look at those photographs now. And unlike other videos I've made, I'm not going to 
talk over them ad infinitum. I'm just going to show them as a little slideshow. Some of them were taken on a rather overcast April evening, so in very marginal light. So as I'm having to use the cloudy setting, I'm getting less depth of field. So pay attention to how much sharpness from the front to the back there is in some of those photographs. And then throughout the roll of the film, you'll see it's also been used in very bright lighting, and you can get a view on how that looks. So I'll speak to you again in a few minutes. So those were some photographs I took in a roll of Kodakala 200. Um, I hope you'll feel as I do, the camera acquitted itself remarkably well. Minox are absolutely brilliant at this sort of design where they design out problems. So rather than putting more and more features and more and more complicated manufacturing in, they do the mathematics properly and they get the, the ideal or optimal fixed focus distance uh, and range. So once again, it's an F4 lens. Other Minox cameras tend to be f2.8 and we can see this is marked a colour minor as opposed to a colour minotar. So the other cameras have a better quality faster aperture lens with manual focus. This one is fixed focus but as I think you could tell from those photographs it actually worked really well. Using the exposure technique I described earlier and having a fixed focus camera actually makes this camera very easy and a lot of fun to use. I did enjoy taking these pictures with it over a period of a few weeks. Now because it didn't appeal to the core Minox user, people that wanted a camera that had some influence over exposure, the AL didn't sell in massive numbers. And I think that's a bit of a shame. Everyone that bought a Minox 35 from me back in the 80s always said the same thing. They wanted it as a visual notebook. And that's terrific. No problem with that. But surely if it's just a notebook, you want it to be as easy to use as possible so you can take a note of something visually and then go back with your posh camera later on and, and maximize the uh, the scene that you've seen or the location you found. Um, that's just my view, but nonetheless it wasn't terribly popular. It was moderately expensive even though it was the cheapest Minox or the lowest price Minox. It was still something like £150 at a time you could buy a sure shot for 100 to 130 and the short shot, of course, had auto winding, auto film loading, DX coding, and a built-in flash unit, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It was two or three times the size, but it did have all that stuff built in. So today, they seem to sell typically privately for between fifty and a hundred pounds uh, from a, a retailer with a warranty. Uh, anything from about eighty to one hundred and thirty pounds, depending on the quality of the retailer, the quality, the condition of the camera. Uh, and uh, what sort of warranty you're getting with it. I was super fortunate in that I actually found this uh, on eBay for £25. Um, it was an auction and, and frankly nobody else bid on it. It was clear on the photographs that these screws were a little bit corroded, which they are, so that was probably a worry. But I took a chance and um, grabbed a bargain. I'm not going to tell you whether you should buy one or not, or, or recommend it or not. I like the camera, I think it's terrific. In some ways I actually prefer using it to the more conventional Minox 35mm cameras, just because it is uh, basically easier to use. That's, uh, the, the other cameras in the viewfinder have a little uh, swing needle to tell you, warn you of uh, slow shutter speed, which is useful. But uh, a big blinking red LED in the front of your eyeball really stands out to warn of low shutter speed. So just changing the weather symbol uh, makes life a lot easier. Anyway, those have been my thoughts on the Minox AL. Super little camera, 
uh, wouldn't fault anybody for buying one. Thank you for watching. I do appreciate it. All the best.